from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Heim, and I'm a general assignment reporter at The Washington Post. The Washington Post has been a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival since its beginning. Uh, they required me to read that line. If you're tired of hearing about Brooklyn all the time, and by now who isn't, then Jerome Charon's Bitter Bronx, a collection of short stories about New York's less glamorous borough, is probably the book for you. The Bronx is where Mr. Charon grew up, and 13 Stories is, as the New York Times wrote, an interlocking collection of sharp-edged fiction whose characters convey an inherent Bronxness, resilient though haunted, striving, simultaneously proud, and a little ashamed of their origins. If stories about the Bronx don't do it for you, I'm sure you could find something to your taste in one of Mr. Charon's 50 or so other highly praised novels. I think he's written more books than I've read. <laughs> or perhaps in his many nonfiction works, which include books on Joe DiMaggio, Marilyn Monroe, and Quentin Tarantino, a trilogy that must say something about 20th century America. The writer Jonathan Lethem wrote, Jerome Charon is merely one of our finest writers with a polymorphous imagination and crack comic timing. Whatever milieu he chooses to inhabit, his characters sizzle with life, and his sentences are pure vernacular music, his voice unmistakable. All of which is to say that Jerome Charon is a wildly accomplished and prolific writer, and I'm very pleased to introduce him here today. Jerome. You can all see this highway. Can you all see this highway moving right through the middle of uh, the Bronx? Can you all see that? You know, um, this is one of the great disasters of modern time. And maybe it is the greatest disaster of modern time. Uh, Robert Moses, do, do most of you know who Robert Moses was? I mean, he was the master builder um, of New York City and, and, uh, and other areas. He built Jones Beach, for example. Um, he happened to be the, um, um, the head of the, the, uh, you know, the, the Department of Parks in New York City. To, uh, so I'm, first of all, he's the devil, and I hate him. But I'm going to give him his due. OK, I'm going to give the devil his due. He was one of the first to build playgrounds for children in New York City. Okay, for poor children in, 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 in the outer boroughs uh, where, where there had never been any playgrounds. Okay, then he became the head of the Triborough Bridge Authority, and he amassed an enormous amount of power, so much power that he had his own currency. He didn't deal in dollars. The Triborough Bridge Authority had its own currency. They traded in their own money, like Monopoly, okay? And he could do whatever he want and wanted. And even though we're not aware of it, he really was, and I'm, I'm not joking when I say this, the most powerful person in the United States. For example, he got into a feud with Franklin Roosevelt, you know, in the late 30s and the early 40s. And so he couldn't get back at Roosevelt. He wasn't going to take on the Marines. So what he said, well, we have this aquarium in Lower Manhattan, and we know that it's Mrs. Roosevelt's favorite place. Because at this time, she was also a teacher, and she was taking students to the aquarium. So let's take the aquarium out of Lower Manhattan and dump it into Queens, where she'll never go. Okay. And this is what he did. This was his way of getting vengeance on Franklin Roosevelt. He couldn't take him on mano a mano. You know, he wasn't a soldier. And also, to Moses' credit, he wasn't interested in personal wealth. You know, he came from a very upper, upper middle class background from the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Uh, he wasn't interested in money. He had holes in his shoes. He wore the same sort of shabby clothes. So it wasn't money he was interested. It was raw power. And also, he was a racist and a terrible racist. So that when he built Jones Beach, for example, it was 
mainly for a middle class culture. Uh, it wasn't for poor people, it wasn't for Latinos, it wasn't for blacks, it was for the middle class at the edges of the borough um, to survive. Now, in the 1950s, he had this incredible, I mean, what's ironic about him is that he himself never drove an automobile. He did not have a driver's license, but he believed in the absolute future of the car. He said, the car will change America. Now, it's common knowledge by every statistician that whatever highway he built, wherever he built, did not subtract from traffic, it only added to it. It only put more cars in place and clogged more highways. Okay, so he ruined Queens to a certain degree, but Queens is Queens. Okay, I'm not interested in Queens. So <laughs> I remember I, someone was doing uh, a screenplay on one of my uh, books, and they were talking about the highways that Moses built in Queens, and I said, you take that out of the script. It has nothing to do with what interests me. Okay, so what, what Moses did is that he decided he was going to divide the Bronx, build a highway right through its spine so that it would be divided by north and south. Okay. Everything north of the highway retained its identity. It was middle class. It may have been ghettoized in terms of Italians, Jews, Latinos, but it retained its identity. Everything south of the highway lost its identity. It lost its power, it lost its grace. But more important than that, he had the right of eminent domain. So if your neighborhood happened to cross the area of the highway he wanted to build, he went to the governor and said, okay, we tear down this neighborhood. Now, these were lower middle class neighborhoods people who didn't have money to hire lawyers, to contest him, to fight him, to argue, to stall, because you could stall him forever. So he just tore down very, very uh, fragile, lower middle class neighborhoods um, in Italian, Jewish, black areas in, in the Bronx, and they never recovered never recovered, completely destroyed. The only reason that the South Bronx still exists is that we have Yankee Stadium. And Yankee Stadium is a kind of stronghold, and we have a few courthouses in that area. Without Yankee Stadium, everything in the South Bronx would have deteriorated. Now, for a very long time, I couldn't go back to the Bronx, and um, I could only go back at a certain time. But before I talk about that, I just want to talk about Robert Moses' downfall. Does anyone, I know, Lenore, you know, so you're the shill in this organization. You're not going to give the answer. Okay. I happen to live on West 67th Street in Manhattan. Now, People who don't know West 67th Street, it was the corporate headquarters of CBS. It was also where many of the killer lawyers lived, the killer corporate lawyers lived. And first of all, Moses wanted to build <coughs> a highway right through the middle of Greenwich Village. But there's a woman by the name of Jane Jacobs who lived on Hudson Street. And she organized everyone so that Robert Moses would not be able to destroy, because he would have destroyed Greenwich Village. He would have been a highway right through it. Okay, but this is not a highway. All he wanted to do was get rid of a playground on West 67th Street where I happened to live at the time. So what happened? He starts tearing it down, and the nannies, you know, of the parents who lived there said, you know, we can't, uh, you know, Mrs. Smith or Mrs. Lawrence or Mrs. Berg, uh, 
we can't take our chil your children to the park anymore because the playground doesn't exist. So the wives told their husbands, their husbands told Governor Rockefeller, and in one month, Robert Moses was forced to resign. He took on the wrong purse people just for one little playground on West 67th Street, okay? Now, I happen to grow up in, in the South Bronx, so <coughs> I just want to read one little paragraph about what it meant to grow up in this poverty-stricken neighborhood. The most important thing is that I've always felt for a long time, and maybe many of you will not agree with me, it's true, poverty, I mean, if you don't have enough to eat, it's a terrible thing. So I'm not in any way, you know, talking about that. But to me, the essential poverty is the poverty of education. If you don't have language, you don't have anything. For example, where I lived in the South Bronx, um, every day I had to go to school. <coughs> I had 10 fights each day, and many of them were with girls, not with boys. They were tougher than the boys, and I got beaten up every single time. But I was still willing to fight, so I got to school. But the real poverty to me was there were no books. There were no bookstores. You couldn't find the New York Times. I didn't know what the New York Times was, so we had no language. And from a very early point on, I said, there's only one thing I want. I don't want money. I'm not interested in power. I'm not interested in killing people. I'm not interested in being killed. I want to learn how to use language. That's what would interested me. Okay, so I'm just going to read this one paragraph. For a long time, I couldn't go back to the Bronx. It felt like a shriek inside my skull or a wound that had been stitched over by some insane surgeon, and I didn't dare undo any of the stitches. It was the land of deprivation, a world without books or libraries and museums where fathers trundled home from some cheese counter or shoe factory where they worked, with a monumental sadness sitting on their shoulders where mothers counted every nickel at the butcher's shop, bargaining with such deep scorn on their faces that their mouths were like ribbons of raw blood, while their children, girls and boys, were instruments of disorder, <coughs> stealing, biting, bullying whoever they could and whimpering when they had the least little scratch. So this was the Bronx in which I grew up. Okay, now, for a long time, as I said, I couldn't go back to the Bronx. And then when I was about 50 years old, the BBC was making a documentary on, on the South Bronx. It was in the 1970s, and I don't know if you're aware of it, but the whole borough was burning. The whole borough south of Moses Highway was completely burning. So what landlords would do, I mean, since they weren't collecting rent, if they hired, you know, neighborhood kids to burn the buildings, they collected insurance. So we were standing on a hill close to the <coughs> public school where I had attended as a boy and it really looked like East Berlin. Now, I've been to East Berlin, and I can tell you that's one of the worst places I've ever seen in my life. When, you, when the movement, when you go across, at that point, Checkpoint Charlie from West Berlin to East Berlin, and you see this wreckage, you're really astounded. And this is the same way I felt uh, when I went, you know, when I looked down upon the Bronx. But something crazy happened, and I, I want to describe that. The BBC was doing a documentary on the Bronx. It must have seemed like an exotic place to the British, with mile upon mile of rubble that reminded them of the London Blitz. 
because this is the way London was during the war. We roamed the Badlands in a big van, and I left, and I felt a kind of exhilaration. And this was very surprising, because I thought I would be so depressed. I would be walking with my nose near the ground. I wouldn't be even able to stand up, you know. As if I inhabited all the empty, you know, as if I inhabited all the empty spaces, and I realized that I'd been shaped as a writer, not with words I didn't have, because I didn't have them, not with lavish pencil cases, not with library books I had never borrowed, but with some ghost's vocabulary. Now that's very important. Something did happen in this crazy brain. I filled that amorphous void of the South Bronx with my own imagination. And I remember as a boy um, in the fourth grade when, you know, there was always a time when the teacher said, okay, teacher didn't want to teach, story time, you, you, you go up and tell a story. And most of the kids were completely stumped. I got up and I, like Scheherazade, I could speak for half an hour, just invent, I don't know where it came from, it was, you know, maybe comic books, I don't really know, but I told endless tales until people went a little bit crazy and told me to sit down, but that's how I began as a story writer. And as I stood on a hill near the Grand Concourse with the BBC and its camera crew, peering at the carcasses of burnt apartment houses below, I sensed a willful design in all that ruin. Could almost hear a chant, a war cry, or perhaps it was a ringing in my ears. Whatever music I had had risen from that bedlam of the Bronx, all the staccato sounds, the syncopation of sadness and loss, I'd been like an amnesiac during my self-banishment from the Bronx, never realizing that each sentence I wrote had come from these lower depths. Now that's very important, is that I couldn't have flourished or continued to write without this imagination that I'd gathered from the void. And it's Emily Dickinson who said about language that it had to be zero at the bone. And this is the way I was. All right, I'd like to go to the second image, please. Is anyone familiar with this image? Does anyone know? Yes, and I'll pick on you because I know you'll tell the truth. No, no, tell me what it is so we'll know. Yeah, and what is it a photo of? Okay. It's called The Jewish Giant in the Bronx, I think 1956. Now, if you all look at this photograph, you see this very, very strange man. Um, he, um, he's looking down at his parents and um, and they're utterly amazed when they look back at him. His name is Eddie Carmel. Now he was, he had acromegalia so that he grew to be eight feet, eight feet tall. When he was at Taft High School, he needed to sit in the entire first row. When he went to Bernard Baruch College, he could barely fit into the classroom. He became a stockbroker because everyone was interested in, you know, getting stocks from Eddie Carmel, who needed two desks. Okay. Then he became a freak in a circus. And Diane, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Diane Arbus as a photographer, but she was interested in sort of freaks in getting the, the perversity of human existence. Now, when I first saw this photograph, I was overwhelmed because Eddie Carmel, I thought it was the story of my life because my own parents who were immigrants didn't have any idea who I was, what I wanted to be, what I talked like, what I, you know, was interested in. And I was interested in books, and there were no books in the house, so uh, they were completely, of course, I wasn't eight feet tall, 
but I might as well have been an eight feet tall freak because if you look at Eddie Carmel's parents, they're absolutely bewildered by him. They don't know what to make of him, and it's not simply his size. Now, I wrote a story called D, which is about Diane Arbus, but I didn't want to name her in the book because I felt that um, I wanted it to be, for those people who knew Diane Arbus, it would, it would mean something. For those people who didn't, it wouldn't mean anything at all. So I wanted to um, write about the process of her taking this photograph. Now, it seems like it's a very simple photograph, but it took her 10 years, 10 years to do this photograph. She photographed him many times, and, and she photo, you know, because at first he was a musician, he had his own rock band, he became a film star, of course he played Frankenstein in every film he was in, but he had a certain local fame, okay. Then he developed scoliosis, and his back began to bend over, and from eight feet he went to seven feet, and then... He went from seven feet to about six feet ten, and he wasn't, you know, the famous giant anymore. All his local fame had disappeared. So this is, I'm going to read a, a passage uh, from the story where um, Diane Arbus finally, after ten years, is able to take this photograph of Eddie Carmel. And she's very perverse because she's only looking for freaks. You know, she's only looking for those people who are strange and capturing them in a moment of pain because he is very pained here, very puzzled, okay? So she goes up and visits him, you know, after this 10-year process. And she was, even though her name is Diane, she was called D, Diane. Deanne, he said with a quiver in that deep echo chamber of his, what happened to you? You're a bundle of bones. His mother and father were about to withdraw because they didn't want to be, you know, in the picture with Eddie Carmel. They didn't want to intrude. But Dee held them with her own invisible string, soothed them with nonsense songs like the patter of a mockingbird. Then she appealed to the giant, Ed, I'd like to try some photos with you and your mom and dad. They're shy, he said. They're not like me. They've never been near a circus, Deanne. Perhaps he wasn't eager to share the landscape or the photograph with his mom and dad, and she wondered if she'd ever capture Eddie Carmel. But of course, she's very stubborn. She smiled, she wheedled, she danced around Ed like a coquette, and finally the faltering giant agreed to pose with his parents, and she also had to wheedle them. They would rather have sat behind a closed door and not be reminded of the monstrosity in their living room. Dee couldn't have coaxed them without Eddie. Ah, oh, come on, says Eddie, it's for posterity. And then he revealed his wickedness in a gentle way. He tried to straighten his crooked back, preened for a moment, and said, Diane, isn't it awful to have a midget mom and a midget dad? <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Carmel didn't laugh. They posed with their giant son. He had to lean on them. Remember, he's not strong anymore. He's not the local bully. His parents had become Eddie's twin canes. They stared into her camera, but something was wrong in this family portrait. Again, he's, she's trying to pose them, you know, and she can't get the photograph that she needs. Eddie Carmel was still the performer, still the star. His big ears overwhelmed the frame. Dee clicked and clicked. Nothing happened. She was forlorn. Then he fumbled with his canes and stood without the help of his mom and dad. She caught him in profile with one of his canes hidden and much of his vanity gone. Mr. and Mrs. Carmel 
looked up at Ed like immigrants who had spawned a monster in the new world. And Eddie ch clutched his canes and stared back at his mom with an aloof tenderness that only a giant could have. And there is a kind of tenderness in that photograph. It's really amazing. It, it has, it's its own complete tale. Declicked. Eddie stood there in his wrinkled pants while Mrs. Carmel was in a daze and Mr. Carmel struck his own pose, if you notice he has a kind of dignity, with a hand in his pocket, distancing himself from all, the, all giants and his son, as if I did not give birth to this freak. One of the art directors work, she'd worked with had called her a huntress, and she probably was. She found what she wanted. It was as if the image itself had pressed the shutter. Some of her compassion had fled after that click. She wouldn't photograph Eddie Carmel again. This was the last time she photographed him. And now she was trying to distance herself the way Eddie's dad had done, but she couldn't. Eddie Carmel clung to her bones. By some miracle, she scrambled down from Eddie's hill with all her paraphernalia and was able to find the subway. But her elation didn't last. Once she arrived at her pauper's castle near the docks, she fell into a crippling gloom. She began to phone people at random while she chatted with some curator at an art museum in Kansas. Dee pretended she was a mermaid following a barge on the Hudson, but even that couldn't console her. She smoked a little pot and all the belief in her own power was gone. The right to stir up some mischief in a portrait session and then to hold that mischief in the frame. She felt guilty about the giant. She'd stolen into his life, posed him in his family like a minor league Vas Vasquez, Vel Velasquez, while she stood there, a lurking presence in the photograph. She'd manipulated Eddie Carmel. She was better off posing Mae West. Dee didn't mind stealing from her. Mae West was a profusion of masks. Dee had caught the rage under her creams and cocoa butter, the madness of decrepitude. And I'll just read one final page. But Eddie Carmel was visited by old age before he was old, and even that couldn't anger him. She shouldn't have pursued the giant. Distressed, she began to doze in the dark. She forgot to unplug the phone. She fumbled for it as the ringer ripped into her sleep. Deanne, it's me. Eddie Carmel listened to her cry. I'm a tramp, she said. I'm a stinking siren. I took advantage of you, Ed. I'll tear up all the rolls of film. Calm down. Mom said she'd be glad. I, she's glad I have a friend like you. I'm a witch, I, but I'm blue without you, D. I can't dream up a poem. Give me a hint. Huh? He liked to write poetry, and she would give him hints about these poems. But she had no hints. Her mind was all scrambled. Eddie pleaded with her, "Have a heart." And she came out of her gloom. She scratched her chin with her own normal-sized knuckles while she recalled the carbuncles on Eddie's hands. Hill, she said, Hill and court jester. Ah, that's a real conundrum, he said, as he started to compose. Look at the giant who lives on the hill. He laughs and he cries like a court jester. But one morning he swallowed the wrong pill, and now the whole world can watch him fester. Eddie Carmel roared at his creation. His poem was as sad as the dwarfs defilmed in their rooming houses, but the giant's deep rippling laugh went right through the wires. D, I'm helpless. I can't write a poem without you. He hung up, but the echo of that roar remained in her ears. So this is my telling the story of this photograph. You can put the third one on. So are there any questions? And Lenore, I think you had a question. Sure. I should hope so. Yeah, can you move to the can you move to the microphone? 
Yeah, okay. Okay. One is about Robert Moses. Evidently, people are starting to think that he is not the monster that you see him as. And I'd like to know uh, whether you, why you have such anger against him. I think you've told us a little. And the second one I'm going to ask is going to be, uh, compared to all the novels that you've written, you don't write very many short stories. What's the difference when you try to write a short story? Okay, I'll, I'll answer both questions. Yes, unfortunately and sadly enough, there's been a rehabilitation of Moses. As a matter of fact, there's been a graphic novel made in France devoted entirely to his enormous creativity. And I'm, I'm not in any way denouncing his creativity, but I think he did so much evil, he harmed so many people that I really can't forgive him. Of course, New York is becoming more and more expensive, and suddenly, I mean, I, I, I was looking at the New York Times and I couldn't believe it. I saw that Chase Manhattan Bank and Citibank were investing in 10 buildings in the slums of the Bronx, and I realized why. Those buildings are terrific. They're Art Deco masterpieces. Pretty soon there's gonna be no more space in that ominous borough, Brooklyn, and there's going to be no more space in Queens, and people aren't going to want to travel to Staten Island, so where can they go? They're going to go to the Bronx. So the Bronx will come back in some way, despite Moses, but still, it has this highway in the middle of its spine, so um, he created what one person has called herbicide. It's the death of the center of the city. And this has not only happened in New York, it's happened in Washington, D.C., it's happened uh, in Chicago, it's happened almost everywhere. If you look outside this convention hall, there is a kind of herbicide going on right here. It's not quite as thorough. But the thing is, um, I can never forgive him for taking these vibrant communities and destroying them. He could have found another way. He could have built above, you know, he could have built the highway above these communities without, without destroying them. And also, the fact that they were voiceless was very important to me. Had they had any voice, this never would have happened. It's only because they had no one to speak for them. I mean, when Jane Jacobs herself, on her own, wrote this wonderful, extraordinary book called The Life and Death of American Cities. This one woman who lived on Hudson Street, she just said very simply, you cannot have a street without a streetscape. You must have stores, you must have a kind of vital life on the street or the neighborhood dies. And this is why so many of the projects um, that Robert Moses built uh, are now destroyed because they did not have uh, any kind of vibrancy. And also, he did some terrible racist things which I really are so racist I don't want to talk about. But I'll tell you in private, I don't really want to talk about them in public. I mean, they're so awful that uh, I'm ashamed to even repeat them. But. Um, no matter what good he did, and he did a great deal of good, it cannot wipe away his heartlessness, his racism, because he was racist. He was basically building for a white middle class, hoping that they would move out into the suburbs. So he was building these avenues within Manhattan and the Bronx. He wasn't able to do it in Manhattan, but he would have done it that would take people out of the boroughs and allow them to live in these sort of fake uh, communities um, away from Manhattan, and these terrible, terrible, horrible places of one house after the other looking exactly the same. I won't even give you the name of these towns. They're all ghettos again. I mean, nobody wants to live there. <laughs> 
Okay, Lenore's second question is very important. It's almost impossible to write a short story. Um, I found that um, an editor of mine in France said, well, why don't you do a book of short stories on the city? You know, and I said, okay, I'll try to do these short stories. So I began writing them. They were impossible to write. And I said, okay, I'm not writing short stories. I had certain favorite writers like Flannery O'Connor, for example. And I read those writers I adored. I learned absolutely nothing because I'll tell you why. Flannery O'Connor has her own magic and you don't know where that magic comes from. That magic does not exist in her novels. It exists only in the stories. And when you try to analyze them, I can give you a reason why the stories are great, but I still wouldn't be able to write them. So I said, okay, I'm not going to write stories. I'm going to write novels, but I'm going to compress them into 10 pages. It's like taking taking a car and squeezing it and putting it on the junk pile. But okay, so instead of junk, you're gonna have language that's compressed so that you're gonna move into the past, the present, and the future. But you're gonna do it in, oh, okay. The limit was 20 pages, I won't say 10, because I, I, it's uh, very few of them are, are, are less than 10 pages. But I had to relearn the craft and there are very, very few writers, you can count them, you know, on your fingers, uh, who are masters both at the short story and at the novel, because the novel is an organic, breathing monster, you know. And I think short, Stahl Bellow defined it, you know, where you can put in everything, letters, you can juggle, you can reverse yourself. You can move backward and forward. Anyone who's read Sh uh, Tristram Shandy, for example, it takes 100 pages before the hero of the novel is born, you know. Or if you look at uh, any of Dickens' work, I mean, you know, Great Expectations, and you, you see this boy in the churchyard turned upside down looking at the world. Well. That is the truth of Dickens. He was able to see the world from a boy looking at it upside down. So that it was very, very difficult to do these stories. But once I did, I found a kind of unity um, that made them into a mosaic. And they really were more about the past than they were about the present. So I, that's the way I would answer that. Are there any other questions? Yes, please. I'm curious why the North Bronx simply changed its, its ethnicity, but its buildings didn't just deteriorate. The South Bronx, on the other hand, the buildings completely deteriorated. Okay. Now, why was that? Okay, I'll answer that. Um, the buildings in the South Bronx by and large were tenements and they were tenements for you know you all know how rent control began it was during world war ii roosevelt didn't want prices to be raised so he froze okay all rents not in in, in all i think in in all the major cities it wasn't only new york city but of course, New York City being New York City kept rent control. So for many years, these rents remained the same. And the landlords discovered that they couldn't put um, of new fixtures when their rent, you know, the, their costs weren't being met. So um, when the, the, the sort of recession began to hit, they said, I can do much better by having these buildings burned and collecting the insurance than collecting rent control. Now, the buildings in the North Bronx are not ghetto buildings. So to some degree, it doesn't really matter who lives in them. They can be rehabilitated. So the, you know, the, for example, if you go along um, the, um, let, let me just finish. If you go along, um, uh, the Grand Concourse, for example, 
you see some of the most extraordinary Art Deco buildings in all of the United States. And those buildings have remained. As a matter of fact, it's going across the Bronx and seeing uh, a sign um, on one of the buildings that inspired me to write this whole book. It said, immediate occupancy. In other words, I could walk into the building and rent an apartment right away, and I thought, okay, I can have another life. All I have to do is go in, and so it's that that, that inspired me. So I, in, in answer to your question, wherever the quality of the buildings, and it's not only in the North Bronx, it's also happening in the South Bronx, when the quality of the architecture is very high, those buildings can be rehabilitated and now become condos. So you see this all across uh, the, both the West Bronx and, and the South Bronx. We have two more minutes, so I guess I'll take your final question. Please stand up so we can, yeah. I lived in a one block long street between uh, Van Cortland and Marshall Park. Right. And it was lined with these very kind of tenements you talk about. We didn't like to call them tenements, we called them part buildings. Right. But they were built in the uh, 1920s and they had no special Art Deco architecture. Okay. They looked okay. like blocks. Okay. But yet they look exactly the same now. Okay. If they look when I okay. was a kid, except that the neighborhood. Okay. Is but good. shouldn't you answer that question? You should really be able to answer that question. One reason, and the only reason those blocks have remained the same, is that there is an enormous park, okay, between the South Bronx and that area where you live. That park has served as a means of keeping people away from that neighborhood, and it's preserved the neighborhood. That's also true, for example, if you go to Arthur Avenue. For example, anyone who wants to visit the neighborhood of Arthur Avenue where there are many wonderful restaurants, you can't get to Arthur Avenue by going on Arthur Avenue because it leads nowhere. You have to go up Third Avenue, around a curve, and then get into Arthur Avenue. Where there is an impediment, for example, Fordham University is one. Where you have these barriers that are like castles, neighborhoods have remained the same. Where there are no barriers, the neighborhoods, you know, tenements or whatever it is, they've become completely destroyed. So if you go anywhere in the North Bronx, you will see the value of the real estate has not gone down. I think we've used up our time, correct? Thank you so much. I'm in overtime. I have to stop. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.